Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Happy Father's Day, fathers. Happy Father's Day. And as you know, we can be male or female. Nowadays, anyone that's raising up a child is a father. So happy Father's Day to everyone. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at Oregon Voters Digest, and I'm gonna, we're going to have a, a very wonderful show for you today. We, we, we would like to also acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, the concern, if you will, for the horrific uh, shooting in, in Florida. That was, it was very horrific. We, we're not going to respond to that particular issue, but we, we, hey, we, we understand and we send our condolences out to, to all those who, who lost loved ones in that situation. We'll come back maybe two or three weeks from now when things have settled down and we'll talk about and discuss this issue, okay? All right, and how it relates here to Portland. But today, uh, we, 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 got, we got a couple of guests here that I think you will be of benefit, it will be benefiting you, if you will, of what's going on in our state. Uh, I, will, I will start off by making a point about the fact that uh, uh, we've got Father's Day here and we normally we tend to want to recognize Father's Day here in the city of, of Portland, but unfortunately we got Gay Pride Day and there's been a lot of efforts. Gay Pride Day has always been on Father's Day, and hopefully I've, I've sent I've sent out notices to them, and we've talked about it, but but we have not been able to compromise, come up with a deal. So hopefully, in, in the very near future, I'll be meeting with the gay community, and we'll discuss this. And so hopefully, we may have Father's Day on, on today, and and maybe on the community might consider having Father's Day on another Sunday or another weekend. Okay. With that being said. What we're going to do now is that uh, I've got two guests here. I've got uh, Scott Jurgensen, who happens to be chief of staff for Senator Doug Whitsnap, District Number 28, and uh, he's a very knowledgeable person. He actually does his work down in Salem, uh, and he's going to give us sort of an update of what's going on down in the Capitol and directly, basically talking to the state around the state, which I think would be great. And then we just happen to have a, <clears throat> I was getting ready to say, upcoming. But, but someone's already there, if you will, as far as I'm concerned, with the issues. And I'm talking about Art Robinson, who happens to be running again for the seat of uh, district, uh, that district two, district, four. district number four. Uh, you might have heard the guy's name is Peter DeFazio. Remember this guy? I've always been trying to get in touch with, with Peter, but unfortunately he doesn't answer his calls. I don't know what the deal is, but, uh, but maybe we, but my point is that I've got Art here purposely because he's about issues. And you know how I feel about issues. And he's here today, and, and we're going to kind of get a, a, a feel now of, of what are his issues. And, um, and uh, then we'll have some discussion and get him involved in some of the things that we might be interested in also, too. With that, welcome, gentlemen. Okay, good, here. good. So why don't we start off with, again, Father's Day. I'd like for each of you to just spend a couple of minutes and talk about how, how you responded to Father's Day and, and why is Father's Day so important to you and maybe a little history about the rationale and the like. Why don't we start off with you, Scott? Well, I, you know, I look at your hat and it says Vietnam veteran, and actually my father served in Vietnam. He was a Marine Corps officer, uh, so he retired at the rank of major. Um, he's still around. He's down in Southern Oregon really? in Jacksonville. Yeah, and uh, he's been a really good friend to me over the years. We butted heads a lot when I was a teenager, right, because I was pretty headstrong, mm -hmm. if, if you could believe that. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm lucky enough now to where I, I have kids of my own. Um, I have my little boy who's eight. Um, he gets to spend the whole summer doing what exactly? I have no idea. I think <laughs> summer break is a terrible idea. I had year-round school as a kid. I, you know, the kids just eat food and trash your house all day. <laughs> and then I, I have a stepdaughter who's uh, just turned 18. So I got one kid across the finish line. Ten years from now, I'll have the other across the finish line. And so. Um, I, I, I didn't do anything special today, though. I mean, yeah. I, I was doing a final for grad school this morning, and now I'm here with you guys. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Thank you. All right, Art, how about you? Well, when I think of my father, I think of where he is, because he was an engineer. He built chemical plants all over the world, but he got on the wrong airplane. So he's buried on top of the highest mountain in Europe, where the Boeing 707 that he was traveling has uh, ended up. Uh, as far as myself, I'm very fortunate. I have six wonderful... Uh, young people that I still work with, and I'm I'm very very lucky to have uh, the they're not children anymore, but the family that I have. Okay, well, okay, just briefly on as far as my dad was concerned, he worked in the oil fields back in Texas, and we were from Louisiana, and uh, but anyway, he went to the oil fields aspect of it, and and my brother and I were, were we were there, the offspring, and we've since had our our kids and 
and uh, I just happen to have one here locally. We, we got a kid. We got a lot of grandkids uh, between Norma and I, and uh, we got about 14 of them. Oh wow! And the way I tend to recognize him by the numbers. I just go right down the line, one through fourteen. And number five, will you please come over here and see Grandpa? <laughs> How does that go over? It goes Simple. real well. Yeah. Simple. Because you know, I, I recognize them then when they get their hands out, because I, I know what I've given out. See. <laughs> yeah, if you can learn to talk without using names, you're okay. Yeah. That's, hey, that's, that's great. Same Especially nowadays, I don't know why. I haven't <laughs> used numbers. I probably wouldn't remember those either. <laughs> Anyway, happy Father's Day to all of you, okay? And I'm sure the guys feel the same way. Well, let's get right into our discussion here. Uh, Scott, let's, let's, let, what, give us an update. What's going on down at the Capitol in the state of Oregon? What is going on? Well, I'd say that our governor, Kate Brown, had a really bad, is having a bad month so far. Hmm. And it started a couple of weeks ago when former Governor John Kitzhaber you know, he's been pretty quiet for the most part. He pops up every once in a while on social media or whatever to proclaim his innocence. And, but in this case, he did it to criticize Governor Brown on her position on uh, IP28, Initiative Petition 28, which is a corporate sales tax measure that's coming up. What, what, what is it supposed to do? The corporate sales. What, what, what does it mean? Define well, it a little bit more. It's a tax on business, mm -hmm. and it's to put more money into state coffers. And if this sounds familiar, it's because we had the same exact discussion a few years ago with regards to measures 66 and 67. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing's happening all over again. The state wants more of your money. Uh, so the governor isn't supporting it. She isn't opposing it. But what she did was she released a plan on how to spend the money. <laughs> and former Governor Kitzhaber in his Facebook Post just blasted her for that and said, hey, that's not leadership. And he made a lot of good points. And you know, I wrote a column about it that I'm going to publish tomorrow. Uh, and you say, okay, well, what's his motivation here? Is he trying to make a comeback? Well, you know, the Oregonian had a story the other day talking about his approval numbers. He's got a long way to go if that's the <laughs> case, right? Uh, so it can't be that. Well, is it revenge? Is he looking for revenge? Well, you know, the Governor Brown and the rest of the Democratic leadership threw him under the bus mm -hmm. and I pointed out in the column that I wrote that you could hear the hurt and sense of betrayal in his voice in the recorded oh, announcement really? that he made when he was resigning. I don't think it was either of those things though. And, and I've been very publicly critical of Governor, former Governor Kitzhaber over the last couple of years because I love this state and I think that you know, his final months in office were a real black eye for this state mm -hmm. and, and will be historically. But I think in this case he's right. And this promises to be a nasty and divisive campaign the same way that it was for 66 and 67. Mm -hmm. And he said, we still have the opportunity to bring people together and to come up with a solution. But that opportunity, that window closes pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the beginning of it for the governor. It's one thing if you're being attacked by Republicans in your Cape Brown. You kind of mm -hmm. expect that, right? But she then got attacked by Congressman Peter DeFazio. Mm -hmm on a completely separate issue. Hmm. So not only is she being hit from the right constantly, but she's now being hit from people in her own party. Then it also came out right around then that she won't be debating Republican gubernatorial nominee Bud Pierce at the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association conference that's coming up next month. That, that's huge. And you know, it, it's just one after the other. And then the Pierce campaign released a poll that showed him within a couple of points of her. Hmm. So he's kind uh, of gaining momentum, and she's uh, getting attacked from all sides here. So What about future debates? Has she, she announced that at all? We haven't heard anything about Nothing that, at but all no yet. debates have been scheduled yet. Wow. Wow. Uh, any other goodies? I mean, you talking about one, was there was another one about in regards to wolves in our state. Talk a little bit about that one. That was the issue that uh, Congressman DeFazio has been criticizing her about. We passed a bill during this last legislative session, and it had to do with codifying a decision by the Fish and Wildlife Commission to delist the Canadian gray wolves from the State's Endangered Species Act. And this particular issue is a clear example to me of the urban-rural divide in this state. And I'll give you an example. My senator's district is rural. It's huge. It's a large geographically, I mean, it's the second largest Senate district in Oregon. And as the as we were debating the bill in the legislature, I get a call from Fish and Wildlife and they say, well, can you inform the senator that there are literally wolves in his backyard right now? Hmm. I did. It didn't go over too well. <laughs> right? So it's an issue that, you know, the folks in the rural part of the state, especially Northeast, which is where most of them are, and my senator pointed out, he said, you know, if they're in Klamath, it's a matter of time before they're in Jackson County. Well, they are now. 
and there have been reports of wolves killing livestock now in Jackson County. Uh, so it's a matter of time. I mean, Medford's there, it's pretty heavily populated. Ashland is there nearby. Uh, so in this case, what Congressman DeFazio is criticizing her about is the fact that that bill was part of a compromise, right? Republicans couldn't have passed it on their own because we just don't have the numbers. Uh, but the bill was passed and it was part of an agreement between legislative leadership you know, there were some bills that the Republicans weren't crazy about that they let you know, be voted on in order for that bill to be passed. Mm. And apparently that was quite different than what Congressman DeFazio was telling uh, Kate Brown, or what his understanding was. So he's being vocal about it now and coming after Kate Brown. Wow, wow. So, oh, did, you hear, did you hear anything about that? DeFazio for or against the wolves? Well, he, he's... He wants to keep them endangered? Yes. No, that's about right. That's about right. And they aren't any in Washington, D.C. yet. Right. Well, and they aren't in Eugene either. And you know, our office got a lot of calls as that debate was going on. And we hear from people in the district that say, well, for the love of God, yes, you'll vote for this bill. Uh, but the people who were opposed were folks from Eugene and from Portland and the suburbs, where none of the wolves actually are. Uh, who, who are just definitely opposed to it because, you know, wolves are cute and cuddly or whatever, yeah. but they're not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is typical DeFazio. He, uh, he votes for the special interests that will keep him in office, and he doesn't care about his constituents. Throughout District 4, which is mostly rural, uh, the people will be devastated by wolves, and they're already creeping in, as you pointed out. They're in District 2. Uh, you can live with cougars. And you do, right? I mean, well, you're out there outside we, we of Cape We have Junction. a lot of sheep on our farm, and uh, we have a couple of big guard dogs, and the cougars respect them, and we get along. You don't live with wolves. They eat your dog. And he Sometimes has no respect. DeFazio is showing not the slightest respect for all of rural District 4, which is most of District 4, because those wolves, if they aren't delisted, are going to devastate livestock and threaten people. Mm. That's the way this guy thinks. No, no, it's already happening. I mean, my, my boss in his professional life before he was in the legislature was a large animal veterinarian. So he would occasionally have to stick up you know, mm -hmm. large animals that had been attacked by wolves. So he knows firsthand the kind of damage that they can do. But it's quite different than the message we were hearing from environmentalists in this part of the state. You know, hey. if, you, if you look at the Fazio's campaign cash, you'll find the special interest that likes wolves is giving them some money. It's yeah. the way it always works. Hey, what about DHS here within the Multnomah County area? You know, it was a big issue here with the Yon Child Town deal. And all due respect, the former Senator Carter was kind of like involved in that whole issue. Where is that at this point in time? Well, I think what they're doing is a review of all the foster care homes throughout the state. And if I remember right, there was a story not too long ago out of the Medford media market mm -hmm. saying that they were closing a couple of them down there. So uh, during the last round of legislative days in May, we because the Senate does confirmations for mm -hmm. appointments for mm -hmm. directors mm -hmm. and people on boards and commissions, uh, but the Senate did vote to approve the new DHS director who had formerly been with the Department of Administrative Services. But the audit is still going to go on? I guess it's, it's, on, it's, it's ongoing now. So yeah. the issue is still on the table. The issue is still definitely on the table, and it, it's not surprising. It, we were, stuff about this came up, you know, back in 2005, the first time I was in the legislature working as an aide and one of my first jobs out of college uh, to then Representative Dennis Richardson, who's now running for Secretary of State. And our office got a lot of complaints about the Department of Human Services. And I mean, at one point during that session, that was one of the bills he was trying to pass was kind of a caseworker accountability bill. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. caseworkers go after families and are malicious about it and seem to do it for vendettas, that they can be actually held responsible for it. That bill, of course, didn't didn't mm -hmm. pass. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the consequences of that over the last 10 years. It It's especially sickening when you look at the agency's budgets, especially Department of Human Services, because that budget and the budget for the Oregon Health Authority have been growing in tandem. Now that was the result of legislation passed in 2009 where they got this bright idea that, well, they're doing the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, let's create this whole new agency so we can give free health care to everybody. Well, then instead of having just the DHS budget ballooning, you now have that budget ballooning and the health authority budget ballooning in tandem with each other mm -hmm. at the expense of public safety, at the expense of literally, you know, public education and anything else you could be doing. How much uh, money does the uh, DHS of Oregon get for e from the federal government 
for each child they grab. That would be an interesting statistic it's to look It would be a very into. large number. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Another area that we, we're very interested here within this area, like homelessness. Do you hear any buzzwords? Is that, is that something that uh, you may hear on the floor around about the whole issue of homelessness in the state? Do it, they have a similar kind of... It, it's mostly a, a Portland issue, and it, it did come up recently. My senator is on this task force that's looking into funding for the Department of Fish and Wildlife because it, it's on an unsustainable budget track mm -hmm. along with a lot of our agencies mm -hmm. right now. And the Multnomah County Public Health Director is a member of that, and she did a phenomenal job. What they're trying to do, you know, typically, traditionally, the agency has been funded by licensing and fees for hunters and anglers, except there's fewer and fewer people doing that over time. And that's just kind of a cultural shift and a demographic shift within the state itself. And in the meantime, all this legislation has been passed at the state level, at the federal level, mandating that that department do more and more, but it's on the conservation side of things, of course, like mm -hmm. you know, habitat restoration and uh, managing species, things like that, and even the wolves, right? I mean, it costs mm -hmm. money to collar mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. and monitor them. And so they're looking at that. One of the things they suggested early on was a tax on recreational equipment. And the public health director here in Multnomah County said, hey, wait a minute. A lot of our most vulnerable citizens, because of this housing crisis, are in sleeping bags and tents. So mm. if you're going to put an extra tax on that, you're really hurting these guys. Mm. Yeah. And she was right. Mm. I thought she did a phenomenal job, represented really well on that task force. Well, this corporate tax you're talking about, the United States, federal taxes, state tax, we already have the highest corporate taxes in the world. And if you want more unemployed Oregonians, just raise the corporate tax. It's pretty simple. Wow. Well, and a lot of the messaging behind it's disingenuous, too, because they're trying to say, oh, we're going to spend it on this, this, and that. Here's the secret, though. You can't bind future legislatures, right? Mm -hmm. Revenue bills have to originate mm -hmm. in the House, mm -hmm. but the legislature can spend that money however they want. Mm -hmm. You can't tell them, short of a constitutional amendment, that you must spend it on this or you must spend it on that. But by collecting the money, you further destroy free enterprise, which is the only thing creating jobs. This creates unemployment at the lowest levels. It makes the poor poor, the middle class poor, puts more kids on the street because they can't find entry level jobs. Uh, they've already taxed American corporations into the ground. For Oregon to add more to that is just a form of fiscal insanity. Hmm. Well, the Legislative Revenue Office did their analysis of it, and that was what they came up with. They said hmm. this will cost this many jobs in the private sector but the other side of that coin is, oh, but it'll create jobs in the public sector. Well, that's wonderful. Well, they get well, not as many because the public sector these days is paid more than the private sector. <laughs> Very competitive. Huh? Well, and that's ultimately what it's going to go towards. And, and they can't tell you with a straight face, the proponents of it, mm -hmm. that it's not going to go to pay raises for state employees. Because guess what? Those pay raises have already been negotiated through uh, union contracts. Ah, okay. Some mm -hmm. of which have already happened, some of which may already be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they can't tell you that it isn't going to go towards PERS because it is. It's going to have to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in that sense, it's a bailout. And, and if you look at everything that's happened in the state over the last couple of years, you know, voters gave them the benefit of doubt when they passed 66 and 67. And what did you get in return? You got the worst graduation rate in the country. I think we're doing better now. We're only like yeah. the fourth worst. Yeah. right? And you got cronyism and corruption. Yeah. You got yeah. national embarrassment. You got the business yeah. energy tax credit program. And we're still trying to get down to the bottom of what happened with that. Mm. You got all this money. And you know energy issues especially mm. well. You know I've talked about this repeatedly. For as much as the state has spent trying to encourage renewable energy development and solar panels and things like that, solar still represents a fraction of 1% of the electricity generated in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. And even my wife, she's apolitical. She doesn't pay attention to this stuff. She says, but it rains nine months out of the year. Right? <laughs> Why are we trying to be the solar capital of the world? <laughs> That's a good question. Come testify in committee. <laughs> Follow the bouncing ball. <laughs> Tell these guys what's going on. Yeah. Hey, uh, another little update here, because we're probably major impact on the whole issue of marijuana. Where is that right now? I mean, a, a county sort of like doing their own thing in terms of how they're going to basically police this issue? Yes, and that was one of the things that we had to deal with legislatively, and that's arguably been one of the most productive uh, of the committees, was the bicameral, really? bipartisan committee to implement Measure 91. Uh, his state representative, my mentor Carl Wilson, is a member of that mm -hmm. committee, and uh, I think it was a balance between upholding the will of the voters 
and making it fit into the statutory framework that we already have in place for it. Mm -hmm. it that came up in the Fish and Wildlife Funding Task Force because that was one of their first options. So now, now that that's on the table, now that the revenues are coming in for it, everybody's trying to get a piece of it. So that was one of the initial ideas was, ooh, well, maybe we can get some more marijuana tax money <laughs> to fund fish and wildlife. Uh, but when, when you add up all the fees and all the taxes and everything the states put on this marijuana thing, uh, they're going to get most of the money. So basically, the state's going in the marijuana business, and these marijuana growers are going to work for them. There's a little transition period here, and you see it all over Josephine County. They're growing marijuana everywhere. I was going to say, yeah. But and that, and the, the prices are still high because the supply is just increasing. But the supply is going to increase, drive prices down, mm -hmm. and the fees and taxes are going to go to the state. So mm -hmm. I think they're going to put a lot of these marijuana growers out of business, or Conversely, we just say they work for the state in the marijuana business. But, and then it's a matter of time before they're unionized, right? And, and that's what yeah, I said. Yeah, a, a, public employee unions, <laughs> marijuana growers before long. I can see it coming. You're right. I said that a couple of years ago. Um, it was during, I think, the 2014 session. A guy who was a reporter who now works for uh, Multnomah County. And I said, watch. You just wait and see. By the time they're done with all this, all these pot-growing hippies are going to be raging Republicans. They say, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> By the time they're done dealing with the Health Authority and OSHA and the Bureau That's of exactly Labor right. and Industries, sure. by the time they're done dealing with all these different agencies and their compliance, they're going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because up until now, they, you know, he knows. He, he lives in the Cave Junction area. I did. Uh, I reported there for years. That's as close to a free market as you get down there. Yeah, well, some of it still is. That was the libertarian element, because even with this controlled thing with yeah. the voters pass yeah. and everything, we still have guys walking around with rolls of $100 bills. Hmm. So uh, they're probably not paying taxes. Right, and Cave Junction... So there'll be tax enforcement well, that, uh, will oh, have yeah. to be required. Well, that'll be difficult down there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the thing. I mean, Cave Junction is considered on paper an impoverished community, right? Because of the state's land use laws, well, because of the logging restrictions. They destroyed our lumber industry. They destroyed our legitimate industries. And but it's a wash in cash every bringing, October. Bringing, yeah. bringing <laughs> it's, uh, this is a disgrace, and our congressman helped him do it. Who was he? Peter DeFazio. Oh, Obviously, okay. I'm getting in my licks against this guy. That's who I'm running against. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of one edge of the district because it, it's not all of Josephine County that's in that. It's kind of broken up to where Grants Pass proper is in the second congressional district that was represented to give by Greg Walton. more Democrats to District 4. Yeah, but you know, Cave Junction is interesting like that. I've always described it as the only place I can think of where all the hippies have guns. Well, it's because they're growing their pot crops and they <laughs> don't want anybody else hanging out. You know, and I imagine that's still the case. I haven't been down there in actually, a while. Actually, I don't want to make enemies elsewhere in the state, but Josephine County is the best county in this state. It's a wonderful place. Yeah, and, and I guess that I just wish I would have been able to make a living there. A lot, a lot of those hippies are good people. Yeah. I had a experience with one he came to a meeting that i was going to and he's obviously a counterculture guy and yeah. i said you know i told the audience i said you know what there are a lot of people on the streets down here that are different than me and they all knew what i talked about and i said every time i see one of them i'm glad he's there because if he can be free to live the way he wants to live i can live the way i want to live hmm. then i pointed at this guy and i said i bet this guy didn't vote for me and he says i will next time <laughs> there, 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 there's more freedom in Josephine County than almost any other place mm. in the country. And sure, we have this oddity of the marijuana business, but now the whole state's going to it, so we're not even going to have that. Mm. Hey, guys, what about uh, another area that we're very interested in? Mental illness. Mental illness here in this, in this county, big time. We've got a lot of problems in this area. In fact, that's, that's probably the majority issue with reference to homelessness. You got me? And we're trying to steal squabbling, trying to figure out where to, where to get these people to live. But mentally illness, people on the street, dying and whatever. Anything with reference to the possibility of building of facilities around and accommodating these folks around the state? You, Mo you hear anything? Most of my familiarity there gets back to Josephine County because I spent years covering county government down there. Mm -hmm. And they were pioneers in developing drug court where they pulled those cases out from the regular court. And it's been a smashing success. Other counties are now starting to emulate it. And I would go and cover the drug court graduations. And if you aren't crying by the time it's over, there is something wrong with you. Really? Right? You have no heart and no soul. Really? Because the redemption element is huge. The community support is huge. Everyone mm -hmm. comes together for it and so while well, I was reporting on it down there a few years ago you probably know more about where it is now they were thinking about doing a mental health court 
similarly because former Sheriff Gil Gilbertson, who I'd worked with, who I consider a good man, you know, constitutional, yeah. a patriot, um, he said, look, we've got a lot of guys in our jail that do not belong there. You know, they're there because of like nuisance type crimes, mm -hmm. and being in jail actually makes them worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do now is that why don't we shift over a little bit, and you and I will ask questions of Art here. If we give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about, uh, he, he's gone through the primary, right? Yeah. You're now in the general election aspect of it. So. It's probably just you, you and DeFazio, right? Yeah, I are, guess are there so. other entities yeah, involved? We've been here before. In, in, yeah. Are there anybody else at the table? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else at the table, Art? No, just no, the two just, of you guys, right? Okay, well, again, we would like to offer the invitation to uh, uh, Congressman Besides. <laughs> he won't be What's coming. his name? What? Oh, no. Peter, he, Peter, Peter, Peter DeFazio. Peter. You're going to invite him to your show. Now, where is he from? Is that? Well, he's, he's from South Washington. Portland? I thought he was from Actually, South Portland. Actually, he's from Massachusetts. But he lives in Washington. Okay. All right. Anyway, Pete, I'm just making a little rip of your deal. But hey, seriously, why don't you come on? You have been in that seat for quite some time, and I'm still trying to uh, trying to figure out, from my own personal standpoint, is that, boy, we got to have term limits. Now, if you can come on and, <laughs> and kind of share with the public as to the rationale as to why you should continue to be representing that particular seat, because we've got a lot of changes. Things are changing, and, you know, we're really needing, to, we're really needing leadership. And as you note, the people across the board, around this country are saying, hey, these folks have got to get out of there. we got to do something with these this folks. This guy's running for a 16th The term. 16th time, times In two. In the first 100 That's years of our country, most congressmen served one term. 16 times, right? Now the average congressman serves five terms. Jesus Christ. That's but a, our Mr. That's DeFazio years. has served Jesus. 15 terms. That's most of my life, actually. That's 32 that's, years. That's absurd. Gee whiz, I just made my 30th birthday the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, I, I would have been like four if that's the case. Wait, wait. 36. Right, well, Peter, hey, please, come on, come on on to the show and let's educate some folks. Maybe you got you got some wisdom that we need in this, but we definitely need your support. Come on down here. Would you be interested in maybe debating him oh, here yeah. on the show? And three yeah. Campaign so far, he hasn't actually participated in a debate that he didn't control. Really? So okay, good. I'd be delighted to debate him. Okay, and then we'll, what we'll do, we'll have Scott here just to make sure it's, it's a balanced kind of a deal. I'll be on one side, Scott on the other side, and we'll ask him some questions. How about this, Scott? I, well, he uh, wouldn't uh, like that, though, uh, uh, because I actually uh, was press there. secretary for his opponent's campaign back in 2004, oh, yeah. and so I think he's still <laughs> mad at me. Yeah, but, but, he, but he's still there. You know, everything's fine. Right. Well, I mean, I would figure. Oh, I mean, I'm willing to forgive and forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to think he'd be the bigger, better it's man. It's all for him. It's all for you. That's we live in say. a beautiful state. You know what I mean? We, we communicate real well in this state. <laughs> We're the only ones that do this around this, this country. Okay, fine. Okay. Art, what's your, what's your, what are your main issues down in that area? Let's talk about some things. Well, uh, there are a lot of issues because uh, in a general sense, we're trying to save a constitutional republic on a democratic playing field. Mm. In democracy, if you can get 51% of the vote, you can take a man's freedom, his life, and his liberty and his property. Uh, that's not the way our country is supposed to work, mm -hmm. but more and more it is working that way. All of the issues in District 4 relate to that in various ways. Uh, one of the things that has hurt the whole country in this regard, you just talked about, is career politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, it's human nature. I don't beat, uh, you know, he's my particular opponent, so I might say he's worse than most, but actually, once a guy gets to Congress, he's been there two or three terms, and becomes a career man. Then he changes. He votes for his own benefit rather than his constituents. And we see this constantly. Uh, when we had the, uh, the timber thing, big issue in District 4 when they closed the federal forest to, mm -hmm. to the logging and absolutely destroyed our lumber industry, uh, the, uh, they broke contracts. There were contracts between the federal government and Oregon and those counties. The contracts were broken. And if our co we had good congressional representation, uh, the congressman would have seen that the contracts were honored. Mm -hmm. One congressman, backed up by the commissioners from a few counties, couldn't be denied when the law was entirely on their side. But the way these politicians work is they aren't interested in solving a problem. They're interested in writing on the problem, positioning mm -hmm. themselves on the problem. Mm -hmm. So the way these guys did it, and the way DeFazio played it, was he got some welfare for the counties. Now that's a good plan, you see, because Welfare then, for the county. Yeah, he got money. Instead yeah, of yeah. honoring the contracts, these men wanted jobs. They wanted their lumber. They wanted right. their mills running. Right. But instead, he said, oh, well, it's costing you some money. I'll get some federal money. So they got welfare, paid them basically welfare for the counties. Getting paid to not cut timber. Yeah. And then the benefit to that is 
every two years he can come around and say, hey, if you want the welfare to keep coming, you better put me back oh, in. Oh, wow. Wow. That is the way. No, Peter, you didn't do that. But, I know that, that. but that is the standard <laughs> way. The standard way in Washington, in the Congress, Jeez. in the House, and the Senate, is the politician, the career politician, and right. that's what we got today mostly. He looks at the problem, and he never thinks about solving it. He says, how can I write in it? How can I benefit from it? In this case, I use timber. Gee. I was uh, a friend of Harrison Schmidt, who was the last man to land a vehicle on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. And Harrison was in the Senate for six years. He said, he was, and he's like me, he's a Caltech scientist. So a problem had come up, he proposed a solution. Doesn't mean Harrison was always right, but he right. proposed a solution. He said he's the only problem solver in the whole building. All these guys wanted to do was, oh, there's a problem, let's write on it. How can mm. we position ourselves to get more votes? Mm. How can we position ourselves to please the special interests and the corporatists more and get more money? Uh, never solving the problem. Gee. And in Southern Oregon, that absolutely devastated the economy by destroying the main industry of the region. That's an issue. It still is. That's why I've won all four rural counties three times in a row. Pete can't compete with the people in the voters area where he has done this to. Mm -hmm. But he's still competitive at the universities in Corvallis and Eugene because huge amounts of tax money come into those communities for the universities. Now I'm not opposing support for research and support for the universities, but the fact is the main, the main factor that allows this domination in District 4 is economic. After you leave, go south of Eugene, we can beat them every time. But Eugene and Corvallis have high populations and very large uh, influx of money for the universities. That sloshes all over town. So if you interview businessmen, and I've been up and down every main street in District 4, in, and I'm, I'm glad they're prospering. But in Eugene and Corvallis, they're prospering. There's money everywhere. As soon as you go south of Eugene, hmm. fourth to half the stores are shut on Main Street. Wow. And the ones that are open, often there's just an owner in there. He can't afford any employees. He's just holding on. So there's an economic problem. I don't think it's as much ideological as people think. They say, oh, there are a bunch of liberals in Eugene and Corvallis. I don't think that's the problem. People vote with their pocketbooks. And the people in Eugene and Corvallis are prospering because there's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pete's prospering because he's managed to come in with special interest in corporate money, run campaigns, and stay in office, so he's prospering too. He's shipping his money to New Zealand because that's where he plans to retire, but he's prospering. Wow. And this uh, situation mostly derives from a change. The Founding Fathers intended that the members of Congress be citizen volunteers who served for a little while, went home, and somebody else was a volunteer that right. served. They didn't set up the House of Representatives to be a senator for career people who stayed for, in case, his case, already 30 years and he wants more. That's why it's not working. And it's not just Democrats that aren't working. There are a lot of Republicans in the House of Representatives playing the same game. It's a little more common, I think, among the Democrats. But until we get a handle on this, and of course term limits are very popular with the people now because they see this, mm -hmm. and you see what's happened with Donald Trump. They just Those people just want to throw the baggage out. But uh, the problem will not be solved, and we will not get our constitutional republic back unless we can get these career people out and go back to uh, basically representative government where the people that work for us are citizen volunteers. Mm -hmm. That's well, the problem. It's really interesting about that district, too, because I'd spent some time there. I've got some familiarity, campaigned in that district back in 2004. Coos Bay is one of the most underutilized mm -hmm. facilities in this entire state. It's this natural deep water port, yeah. and it ca actually, if you had the infrastructure in place, it could compete with Portland because nobody's using the port anymore yeah, here, yeah. right? You could have those same jobs in Coos Bay it, if you were able to build up the infrastructure around it. Mm -hmm. But instead, that community has been kept poor, almost deliberately so. Mm -hmm. And you know, we did focus groups down there a couple of years ago, and you could tell that the people are really frustrated and they're, yeah. they're open to a change and doing something different. And in this case, you know, Congressman DeFazio gets appropriations for dredging. Okay, we're going to dredge the port and come back every couple of years and do that. And that's, I think, one of the things he uses to kind of keep supporting that area. 
Well, you see how this is done. In a debate we had last time, DeFazio and me, he, he tells the audience, he says, Robinson says he won't take earmarks. Hmm. I get earmarks, he says. I got three million for this group, and I got two million for this group. Look at the money I got you. Hmm. And you know, the irony was there were probably 300 people in that audience. I don't know if there was anybody in there that uh, was from the groups he got the earmarks for, but everybody in that audience paid for the earmarks. Gee. But people think, you know, this is a sugar daddy. And he thinks he's a sugar daddy. So he's, and of course, he gives earmark money to the universities that helps with his politics. But these people don't realize that you can't manufacture something out of nothing. I mean, you see a politician walking around giving money away to get mm. votes, all of the voters paid for that. And now we're going to pay more through some increase in corporate taxes. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting that you brought that up about him because I remember uh, one of the debates that we did manage to get with yeah. him back in 2004. Uh, Oh, here's a guy who's been complaining about the federal debt for a while. Uh, of course, you <laughs> but look at what that number up. was when, when he got elected. One of the guys running it up. Yeah, but he actually said, word for word, when we brought that up, I bring home the bacon. Yep, and yep, you're bragging yep, about yep, that, yep, about yep. those appropriations. But that, that's, that's just, he, he brings home the bacon largely to the corporatists and special interests that he represents. Mm -hmm. And he brings earmark money back to Oregon and spreads it in particular places. But uh, basically, he's a servant of the corporate corporations. We noticed in one of our camp, one of the previous elections, we we watched where his money comes from, and suddenly it's just beer company money from everywhere. The beer companies, the CEOs of the beer companies, the wives of the CEOs of the beer company, vast amounts of beer companies. So we looked it up. He was pushing for lower taxes than beer companies for beer companies. Now, why should beer companies pay lower taxes than other corporations? Because beat DeFazio and wants campaign cash. <laughs> it's, that's the way it works. He's also gotten a lot of money over the years from the transportation units. Yeah, yeah, because that's he's right. the transportation and you can track that do. down. In particular. Yeah. I'm not against these corporations. And, and you know the corporations, uh, they shouldn't be doing these things. Uh, but on the other hand, if they don't lobby mm -hmm. and pay off these congressmen, uh, then they are at great disadvantage with respect to their competitors. Mm -hmm. Microsoft Corporation tried not to have a presence in Washington for a long time, <laughs> and they just beat the heck out of Microsoft until they learned their lesson and they got some lobbyists too. Oh, the antitrust stuff they yeah. were trying to so, sell. So these fellows, the way they work this thing is simply the corporations have to, they go there and they compete in the halls of Congress with lobbyists instead of in the free market, which costs everybody money. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, and the career people uh, work things so that they will help the special interests and the corporatists mm -hmm. so that they'll have campaign cash to be reelected. Mm -hmm. Then in the district, you have an additional problem with newspapers and things mm -hmm. like this. But remember, those people uh, know that this guy's been in office 15 terms. Mm -hmm. They expect him to win a 16th term. Do you think they're going to run articles against him? Nope. It's not good business. Yeah. Imagine being president. the press secretary for his opponent. <laughs> Second <laughs> job out of college. And yeah. I, I'd, so, actually, but, I'd worked with a yeah. lot of these people, right? I'd been their colleagues, and then overnight, yeah. it was literally like being treated like yeah. the enemy. But I don't it's, think, I don't think, bad. Really? although yeah. you want to win an election, and we'll do everything we can to win, but we must represent, we have to teach the people, we have to represent our values to the people. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. running in a base which you don't win, Mm -hmm. If you're articulate, you can start teaching the people more about what's happening to them. <clears throat> They've been told a lot of lies. We've departed from the Constitutional mm -hmm. Republic to a large extent that was protecting the things that they value. And many of the voters don't realize that. So if we, we, everybody, whether it's in a district which is tough to win or a district where you might win or whatever, you could always win. I mean, things can happen. But everybody should run er on their principles and try mm -hmm. to teach the voters, because we're trying to do something that's never been done again in, before in world history. We're trying to save a constitutional republic with a, on a democratic playing field. Mm -hmm. All democracies have eventually become mob rule. Yeah, yeah. I don't think ours needs to be that way, but it's a very difficult thing because it's very difficult to communicate. We have 350,000 households in District 4. It's the size of Switzerland. Hmm. You want to go out and figure out how to send your message to all those people? That's huh. not trivial. Hmm. Well, tell me this now. Uh, nearly the American people are saying we're just fed up with this. That's, that's, yeah. that's, in fact, that's the definition of Trump right off yes, the bat. Yes, that's you right. <laughs> people are fed up. So do you think we may be seeing some change, some major change, change like 
we want term limit, but I don't hear it. It might hear be it. contagious what this guy's What's doing. What's the deal here? What's be going contagious. on? Well, it, it, people talk about this all the time where they say, oh, Congress has a 4% approval rating. Well, that's fine, except because of the way, you know, the big money that's involved, yeah. because of the except way the district starts He's wrong. bringing me money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is at the table. This yeah, is, that's yeah, exactly that's it. Right. That's exactly those right. idiots in Congress. Yeah, except for our guy. We love we our guy. They reelect them. It's like 98% of them get reelected. So as much as people gripe about Congress, it's everyone else's congressman that's the problem. Yeah, but I think the American people, the grassroots American people, are wonderful people, mm -hmm. and they want the privileges of their republic. And I think they're waking up. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trump is an example of that, mm -hmm. and it may be contagious. Uh, mm -hmm. He, uh, uh, this man, is where he is because a very large part of the Republicans decided mm -hmm. they were fed up with the whole mess. And, and, and when and we get into this campaign, we may find out a lot of Democrats are fed up with it too. Yeah. Well, and that, that's where he's a real wild card in all of this, because if, if you look at, okay, how is he going to affect some of the statewide races, the congressional mm -hmm, races? Mm -hmm. it, he could get him elected. It, it could create a wave. It, it could you know, go you know, literally you know. either way. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard to tell. One of the theories is that he has the potential to bring back some of the Reagan Democrats, some of the blue-collar folks who have seen these bad trade deals yeah. affect them adversely and kind of their middle-class prosperity it, it, a lot of the fiscal policies that have been put into place are, are hurting them in their pocketbooks. And you know, maybe you don't feel, you can't articulate or understand directly that the hidden cost of inflation is what's hurting you. But, but you have but, to reach the voters with this message. Mm -hmm. And you just heard me talking, right? How many voters do I reach talking that way? Now, if I were elected, I would follow the rules of the republic. I could do infinitely better than Peter DeFazio mm -hmm. and improve the lives of the people in the district. I think Donald Trump probably would have rolled everything I said into about two sentences, <laughs> and they'd be cheering, mm -hmm. like, whatever it takes. <laughs> and if you do that, and you do that extemporaneously, you're going to make mistakes. And he makes mistakes. But if I spoke three hours extemporaneously, <laughs> I'd be making mistakes, too. Yeah, but on the, I don't but know, the you point were is, pretty good on the talk shows yeah, we yeah, did yeah, down yeah, in Grand yeah, yeah, no, but yeah, the point, yeah, the point yeah. I'm making is, that we do have a bad problem yeah. with the entrenched political yeah. establishment yeah. that's destroying our country and destroying our state and destroying District mm -hmm. 4. Mm -hmm. And the people are showing that they're beginning to understand that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why the Republican Party is having so much trouble right now. They don't know quite how to deal with that. The Republican change. establishment, has, and here's the thing that I've noticed about this primary, which has been unique, yeah. uh, at, le in, at least insofar as I can tell, is that the more the establishment pushes on Donald Trump and tries to tell the public, don't support this guy, we're opposed <laughs> to it. it actually endears him yeah, to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. made him more popular because That's they right. say, wait, we're mad at you, Mitch McConnell. We're mad yeah, at you, yeah, John yeah. Boehner. Yeah. We're mad at you, Paul yeah, Ryan. Yeah. We sent you guys there to D.C. to thwart the president's agenda, and yet here you are passing a trillion-dollar omnibus spending bill that includes all these things in there that we don't want. Mm -hmm. We sent you to Congress to stop these things, and yet here you are giving the president exactly what he wants in these yeah. budgets. Yeah. And so, Well, Paul Ryan. Now, Paul Ryan, I saw him on TV. And he was telling the war reporters, why can't you get more done, you know, you got both. Oh, he says, we can't win unless we have the presidency. Well, I'm sorry. We have a, a checks and balances, three branches of government. The House of Representatives, overwhelmingly Republican, mm -hmm. has the power of the purse. They can't spend a dime in Washington without the House. But he's trying to tell people, unless he has a presidency, he can't do anything. They're crazy. Well, they've been saying that since 2011, because at first it was, well, give us back Congress and we'll get something yeah, done. They yeah. got Congress no, back, and they said, Congress oh, give us done. the Senate, and then we'll yeah. get things done. Okay, you've got the Senate. And give us each 30, 30 years in, 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 <laughs> right. in, in Congress, maybe we'll get it done. Jeez. It's. Uh, I'm going to that convention. I'm a delegate to the Republican convention, and I'm going. I want to see the fun. I also want to see if make them act on principle. Mm. And instead of instead, there are all kinds of machinations being suggested, mm -hmm. yeah. sure. and I'm you know I I was strong supporter of Ted Cruz, but Donald Trump won that won that thing, mm -hmm. and he gets it, and we're going to have to see what happens. But someone's trying to they're still trying to raise up the oh, issue no, from the standpoint. You, you, they, they, they've been will they change the rules? I mean, you always. Know, I don't think it would go over too well if they well, did. Well, it's all the talk, people, but, uh, you know, you don't know what these guys will do. Uh, they do some unprincipled things, and well, they, they're caught in a mess. He threatens to be a third party, too. I don't think you'll have that. You think he'll do that? You might have some shenanigans at this convention, and I want to go to... 
<laughs> have something to say about it if they try. Tim and I a, wasn't the Trump man, but I don't. He won. I'm sorry. All right. Ted Cruz didn't win, although I thought he would make a wonderful president. A, so and a good Supreme Court justice, too. Huh? He'd be a great Supreme Court justice. He'd be he wonderful. Be but yeah. we've got a man. He's been chosen by the Republican Party. I think he can win the presidency. We have to go do it. Well, it, it overwhelmingly, too, it, it, you look at the states that he won, you know, it, and he started off, he yeah. was the guy to beat, and we had you know, a whole lot of candidates at the beginning. He said, okay, well, the not-Trump vote is going to coalesce here. Mm. And then, it, you know, Ted Cruz was one of the last men standing, to his credit, you know, John mm -hmm. Kasich, but that, too. Uh, but it, they the, still, he's, the guy's talking the language of the people. He's talking in short sentences. He's sure he uses exaggeration, but... Do you think these guys that are lying to people all the time aren't exaggerating? They just do it a little cleverly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, three three hours, you know, hour after hour after hour of extemporaneous talk in the language of the people has worked for him in the Republican Party and it may work in the nation. And it's pretty important because the people the other side are putting up are further death for the Republic. Well, and that's what I've heard from the Democratic, the presumed Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton, is that the problem is that we have too many rights. And I've always had this distinct <laughs> yeah. impression with her that she's more concerned with her power than with my rights. That's and not an that impression. That makes me really that's, uncomfortable. <laughs> that's a definitive experimental fact. That's not a impression. Well, yeah, and I, I think what they don't realize and, and what they should realize is that, as far as I'm concerned, my rights and your rights and his rights and your rights were never theirs to give or take away in the first place. They were never the government's to give. These are rights that were endowed to us by our creator that are not governments to give or take away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where does Bernie fits in the deal? I mean, he's still running. Well, Bernie's still running. Well, God bless his soul if that's what he's doing. But at the end of the day, it, this is the process, the same way that Trump got through the yeah. process to win his nomination. And I, I think a lot of Bernie supporters are unhappy and upset because you have this super delegate process where you can say, hey, wait a minute. And some of our congressional representatives here in this state did the same thing, no, where I'm, they were super delegates and said, okay, this state went overwhelmingly towards Bernie Sanders, but you're still going to the Democratic National Convention and voting for Hillary Clinton. Well, it's not hard to understand. The man is a committed socialist. He's honest. That's what he is. He's a committed socialist. Socialism has failed throughout the world. Everywhere in Venezuela, in real time, people so, are eating garbage yeah, and dogs yeah. and cats. They're so, literally starving so to socialism death. Socialism is about the worst thing that could happen to the American people, so I hope they'll reject it. But he's a committed, honest socialist. And he's running right to the last minute because he wants to represent his views and convert as many youth as he can to but socialism. Again, he's it's popular simple. also. Well, he's it, very popular. He, he and Congressman DeFazio have some things in common because well, they they've work both together quite a bit. Been there for friends. a really long time. I, if I remember right, they've both been members of the Progressive Caucus. No, well, they, they were both founders right? of the Progressive Caucus, and he and DeFazio work together all the time. They're, hmm. they're bosom buddies. DeFazio doesn't say what Bernie says because he wouldn't be reelected. He hmm. says whatever the polls say he should say. Hmm. Interesting. And that's different in Oregon than it is apparently where Bernie is. Selected. You know, another area that, that's sort of been quiet and that, sort of unspoken at this point in time, it was kind of like a, it was the leading story, if you will, nationwide and even from a state standpoint, was the whole issue of undocumented workers. You know? Any, any ideas? That one, do you have any idea where DeFazio fits on that deal in the state? And then, well, and I then think from he pretty standpoint. much supports Obama, and Obama, obviously, we know where he stands. Mm -hmm. They'll let them all in. A country without borders isn't a country. And borders work all over the world. Uh, they don't, uh, I don't think we need to build a big wall, but it's a nice visual for Mr. Trump. Uh, most of the borders in the world work fine, and, I, and they don't have walls. But you do have to have borders at work. We don't have borders at work, and that's bad for our country. Uh, the uh, people who come across those borders, for the most part, are uh, hardworking Christian families. And you can't be against them, although other people come across the border too. But the main thing on principle, you don't have a country if you don't have a regulated and controlled border and a reasonable immigration system. Mm -hmm. And now, this situation now where they're bringing uh, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Muslims from the Middle East, where we do have a big difference because they absolutely do not uh, uh, 
concur with our constitutional form of government is a bad problem. And when Trump says, well, maybe we ought to slow this down until we can figure it out, that's just sensible. Uh, but I'm not, again, most of those people are probably uh, mm -hmm. wonderful people with mm -hmm. good families. So they're wonderful people all over the world. We can't take them all. We have to have boundaries, but borders. And uh, then um, okay. it, you just have to have rules and borders. You don't have a country. Okay. And, and Obama has basically uh, given us no borders for his term of office, and this must stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when Trump states it the way he does, he's stating it in a way that, the, that an average show will understand. If you state it, if I were to state it, it might get very complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the average Joe wouldn't understand me, but maybe he gets generally the idea that I wanted a good mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm going to build a wall, 30, 40, however it is. I, I don't keep track of these things. Mm -hmm. um, they say, yeah. Now, the truth is you don't need a wall to, to, to stop that problem, but you do have to enforce the law. And the law says you must apply for citizenship or, or for residency and come across in a legal way. And if we don't do that, our, our, our country is suffering. Okay. Is suffering. Scott, what do you think? What do you hear down at the legislature? Anything happening down in Salem about our issue as it relates to undocumented workers? And well, I mean, we're out of session now, yeah, so right, right, when right, I'm right, in right. the building, I'm largely by myself, and yes. the, the lights kind of turn off on me, and I have to stand up and <laughs> wave my so arm. So you're what's all, all in the Capitol building. I got, got the whole third floor of the Senate to myself a lot of days. Why don't you pass some laws and they didn't even notice? I'm, yeah, right. I'm just there all by myself. <laughs> but yeah, we, we still have uh, interim committees that are meeting, and so, for example, in a couple of weeks, the Department of Intersight, Gen Energy Oversight Committee will meet again. And the Fish and Wildlife Funding Task Force will meet again. So we still have projects. One of the things that we're working on is this work group uh, trying to figure out ways how to get natural gas infrastructure to rural areas. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue that's been very near and dear to me. I covered it when I was reporting in Estacada. Um, my senator has a couple of towns down in his district that uh, don't have gas. Yeah, and if it's a matter, uh, you know, it would come to the realization because the infrastructure is so expensive, if, if you're 50 miles away from the nearest yeah. natural, it's Can't not happening. It you have to have a pipe. That's yeah, I mean, but if you've got a couple of miles, there's mechanisms that we can yeah. use to get it there. So those are the kinds of things we're working on, but for the most part, it's quiet. Everyone's just kind of watching the election, waiting to see what's happening. So I imagine a lot of the folks who normally would be in the building during session are out in their districts campaigning or mm. just working their regular jobs. Um, but you know, when it comes to that issue, uh, it's a national security issue. It, it's a matter of, you know, it, if you look at everything that's been happening these last few years, we are not safer than we were before. Mm. Uh, the international scene has gotten less safe as well. And you say, well, who have been the architects of this foreign policy? I'll give you a hint. One of them is running for president right now, and it's not Donald Trump. The foreign policy of the United States right now is extremely dangerous. I worked hard with FEMA and the federal government during the Cold War, and they're trying, they're reviving, and it's very dangerous. It should not be done. And uh, uh, this business of moving tens of thousands of troops up to the Russian border and aircraft carriers and fleets off the Russian coast, this is insanity. And it, 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 uh, this is Hillary Clinton uh, types in the military-industrial complex. Our country has a one best military in the world. It should be defending us. I'm not telling you there aren't times when you intervene in other places. But this gal is a total interventionist. And this, this time, they're not piddling around with a little country that's not very big. They're fiddling around with a heavily nuclear-armed state, which incidentally is people have tried to conquer for the last couple centuries and no Don't do it won. during the winter time. It's a terrible <laughs> yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. So, right? I mean, the idea that it's smart to have all these military people uh, right on the Russian border holding these exercises is not smart. And it's the same, it's one of the reasons you don't want Hillary Clinton. She's dangerous. Well, and you've got I'm these people... I'm absolutely sure that, that anybody with common sense wouldn't be doing that, and that would include Trump. Well, in, there are some folks within the State Department, you know, current and former officials who sent out that open letter mm -hmm. urging us to yeah, that's just overthrow the, the Assad regime in yeah. Syria. And here's yeah. the thing, though. The Russians have already taken their position there, mm -hmm. and they've said, we're going to stick with the devil we know. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep Assad in power because the alternative is not going to be better. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've seen. The big shift in U.S. foreign policy over the, in this century was that 
before September 11th, your biggest threat came from strong states. It came from Russia, it came from right, nations that were powerful. After September 11th, US foreign policy shifted to say your biggest threats are now from failed states. We have more failed states now than we did under our last Republican administration. We helped some of them fail. It, Hillary it, Clinton caused some of them to fail. Those hundreds of thousands, millions literally, of people marching north with their feet into Europe are largely Hillary Clinton's responsibility. And the Syrian refugee crisis is because Syria is safe and unstable, right? Mm. And if you had resolution there, it, it, think about this, right? You, ISIS has this big block of territory, including you know, Iraq, including Syria, uh, the size of Indiana. Some of these areas in Iraq were having elections. Mm -hmm. They're now having beheadings there. Oh, and yeah, if you look at, yeah, for example, yeah. Libya, has, you know, Gaddafi, bad guy, sure, but he was predictable as far as we were concerned. Mm -hmm. What replaced him isn't better. Egypt, mm -hmm. Hosni Mubarak, he got overthrown, yeah, his regime. Yeah. What replaced him is not better, and they are hostile to our interests. Yeah. We have fewer allies in that region, it, and it's more dangerous than wow. us. Wow, what a, what a bright future we're looking at. Huh? <laughs> well, it's just an <laughs> example a, of what the, the general philosophical bent, we don't have time for philosophy here, okay, real quick, <laughs> of... of of, of Mrs. Clinton is, okay. and it's very dangerous for our country. Okay, and and this this woman must be defeated. Must well, be well, defeated. Well, I'll do it. I take it now that Peter, who's looking at this, DeFazio's looking. He's going to come here and he's going to debate. He's going to be. I don't believe it. But I got, some, get I got it someone done. in. The, I I'm got willing, someone. I'll, I'll I got you. someone to bring him over. I got someone. <laughs> he's sitting in the control room right now. <laughs> Happy Bob, Father's Day, that'd Bob. That'd be great. And I bet <laughs> I said enough things here that he can go after, and that'd be fine. I just that'd love it. Sounds good. Bob will do the interview okay. with with you. How's that? I, I don't with think he will. I'm, oh yeah. Peter doesn't like me. Folks, okay, good. We've done it. Thanks very much. It's been I great, guys. He Thanks for like being more. <laughs> Again, happy Father's Day to everybody. As you can see, we're going. We want to maintain the fathers, right? That's the whole idea, right? Yeah. That's Again, great. God bless America. Take care. Have a good day. Again, happy Father's Day.